Music is all around us. It is the universal language. It evokes many feelings and is something to be shared and celebrated. You have found a place where all kinds of music will be celebrated. So welcome. You are tuned in to the Zen Sessions, presented by Here to Zen Magazine. Welcome to the latest episode of the Zen Sessions. Today we are joined by John Karabi and Paul Miles. So John comes on to chat about his upcoming Australian tour, his new book, Horseshoes and Hand Grenades, which will be out in a week or two. Um, always fun to catch up with John, known him quite a long time. So always filled with great stories and lots of laughs. Then we chat with Paul, who is his co-author in the book. Paul has written many great books before and worked on many great projects. So it's nice to get his side of how the book came together and what it was like working with John. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the two chats and thanks for tuning in. Hey, Crab. What are you doing, boss? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. 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 <laughs> Talking to you, then going to work. Talking to me, then going to work. Yeah. How's things? It's okay, man. Just, you know, hanging out. Just, uh, I was sitting in my house inside for a minute and uh, playing acoustic guitar, changed my strings, and I got a couple of gigs this weekend before I come down there. And for some apparent reason, I decided to try and learn the Rain Song by Led Zeppelin. Great. Not that I can sing it and play it at the same time, but there may be an instrumental, a Led Zeppelin instrumental when I come down to Australia. Just saying. Sweet. I'll join you on Triangle. Okay, good. So, yeah, you got Creatures Fest this weekend, then you're flying straight out. You're a busy man. Uh, you know what? From your mouth to God's ears, it's been a long time, my friend. Uh, two and a half years of sitting here doing, well, I can't say I didn't do anything. I mean, obviously, Paul Miles and I wrote the book, and um, I took Pro Tools classes and learned how to use Pro Tools, and I've just been recording very slowly at a snail's pace um, my new original material that I've been releasing. Um, so I was kind of productive, but as far as money coming in, like gigs and shit like that, there was nothing for, fuck, man, two and a half years. Yeah. So it's been a little little tedious to say the least. And yeah, this weekend, um, how, how many shows are you doing this weekend before you jump on the plane? I play Friday, but then there's some sort of, um, uh, for lack of a better term, all star jam um, Saturday early. Um, and then I do that and I come home and I start getting my laundry together, make sure that I've, you know, shaved my legs and my balls and just get ready for you guys. The balls are the most important thing when you're sitting on a chair. It, it, this, is, this is important. Plus, you know, I do want to be somewhat aerodynamic when yeah. I, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? No one wants hairy I'm, balls on a long I, whole flight. I'm glad we can relate on testicles. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and it's funny that this weekend, once again, there's going to be three quarters of union in, at an event and no union. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, you know, but it, it's funny, like Brent's been very busy with Slash and um, I guess he's doing a side solo thing with Bruce. And Bruce has been busy with Grand Funk and all his things and, um, you know, so... <sighs> It's uh, it's cool, but there's all all of a sudden there's like this weird interest in anything and everything union. So I'm just well, happy that uh, Deco Entertainment is putting the records back out. Yep, and and our other boy, um, they did the vinyl. Fuck, I think the vinyl sold out in like a day. It, it was it crazy. Is. Yeah, and that that project is near and dear to my heart. Being the guy that did the uh, Blue Room cover. Yes, sir. With that, with our boy Pete. Uh, so you did the cover. I did the cover. Oh, okay. I haven't seen one yet, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm 
showed me the cover, but I didn't know who did it. They just kind of sent it to me, and I went, yep, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, no, you know? we used um, one of Fitz's reference photos. because he, he took a bunch on his phone of the actual Blue Room. Right. And then I just, yeah. Hanging out quite a bit um, after the Motley thing during the beginning of Union. I was hanging at that bar quite often. Mm. You've got your two newer songs out, um, Your Own Worst Enemy and Percy Bella. And you've been yes. working with Marty Fredrickson. So all it takes is a quick Google search to see his resume. What's he bought as your as a change to your songwriting and your production? You know, it just, well, if, it, obviously, you know, that he did, um, he did make some noise with the daisies as well. And um, um, burn it down. And Marty's good because he's not only a great producer as far as getting sounds and having, having like an overall idea of what he wants the song to sound like, but he's a great songwriter as well. And so for me, it's not that I couldn't finish a song on my own. I just like hearing, like if I get kind of stumped I like hearing what somebody else would do. What would you do in this part? And a lot of times I'll send Marty some of my ideas as I'm recording them. And then I send him to him and he'll either go, no, nope, great job. We don't need to do anything. Let's just fuck with the, the sounds um, or the tones of everything. Uh, and there's other times where he, he'll write me back, for example, um, your own worst enemy. I kind of recorded it and I couldn't come up with a chorus. And then uh, we kind of bounced something around that still didn't work. Then I eventually figured out like that riff that's in the, on, on the chorus. And, um, but it was funny, like Marty listened to the song and he said, I think, I think the second verse is too long. Do it half the, half the length. So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, you know, and once I did that, like he, he, he just hears things from a different perspective. So I like he is off of him. The problem of it is he's so fucking busy. Yeah. It's like I, I was I, I'm, I'm here in Nashville now and I wanted to get together with him um, this week. But he's working on like uh, uh, I think it's the is it the strokes? Wow. He's working with. And he's working with, you know, Chris Daughtry and he's working with, you know, all these other artists. And I'm like, fuck, I just can never pin him down. But um, so hence, like yours truly, um, sitting in a room on a laptop, very sn slowly, like snail's pace, slowly trying to figure out, like, how does this work? You know what I mean? I'm still, yeah. I, I can do the Pro Tools, but I'm still making mistakes and figuring shit out. So now what I'm doing is I'm just recording everything as far as I can get it. I send it to him and then he's got a stockpile of, you know, several songs now that need to be either mixed or maybe tweaked a little more and then we'll go from there. But, um, you know, onward and upward, slowly but surely. Yeah. Do you have anything in mind for next single and sort of like a time frame? Well, I do have another song done. Um, I want to see what Marty, Marty's got the files. So I'm going to try and get him to start mixing that one. And then I'd like to shoot a video for it. And um, hopefully in the next couple months, put a new sing single out. I'm eventually going to do vinyl and CDs and all that other shit, but this apparently seems to be the way that everybody's doing shit nowadays. Yeah. They put out like five or six singles before they release a record and then just kind of get people talking about everything and then whatever. So I, I yeah. have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just figuring it out as I go. Exactly. And now the book, it's, it's out in a couple of yeah, weeks, horseshoes sure. and hand grenades. So I actually jumped online and I sort of just, went what does this mean and there's a few different meanings so basically 
you know, they talk about you don't, you don't count um, the score in baseball, but kind of thing you count in horseshoes and hand grenades. And there's other sayings that say it's close, but not close enough. So what does horseshoes and hand grenades mean for Karabi? Well, it's, it's the thing. Well, it, it, there's a little bit of a backstory. It came from my father. Yep. And, and there's this American phrase like, you know, when you go, God damn it. I was, I was so close. Yep. And somebody will go close, close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Yep. Um, but after reading, I, I, like my dad had given me that, that, that phrase, you know, years ago. And I always just thought it was a cool sounding yeah. phrase. So I wasn't sure if I was going to use it for a record or if I was going to use it for a book or something, but I kind of kept it close to my chest. And then when Paul and I were finished with the book and we had read the thing like, fuck, 10 times, I kind of realized that I've had a very odd career. Like my career has been full of like I'm basically being, I'm the king of being at the right place, but always at the wrong time. Yep. Um, so after reading the book and, and looking at all the different bands that I've been in and the marriages and the different relationships I've had throughout my life, Mar um, Paul said, well, what do you want to call this thing? And I said, hands down, it's got to be called horseshoes and hand grenades. You know, and when I explained everything to him, he was like, oh, my God, that's perfect. Um, so we kind of threw that little story of my dad in the book. And then we sent it off to the publisher. And they read the book. They loved it. And they actually loved the title. So, um, you know, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Maybe this thing will make me some sort of literary genius. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> but if, it, if, if the book goes the way my career has gone up to this point, nobody will be interested in the book until about 15 or 20 years from now. Yep. And then it will become this cult book classic that everybody is interested in reading. And then you so can it, well, yeah, do an expanded edition with a coloring book. Well, it, it already is a coloring book, but whatever. <laughs> you know, I, I started working on a book like, God, 2005. Mm -hmm. And um, wasn't real happy with it. And then I kind of put it to bed. And the only reason why I didn't pull it back out again is because I was sitting there looking at, like, everybody. And that's my only fear about this book is that I don't I, I, I have this nagging feeling that everybody's going to look at it like oh he's just jumping on a bandwagon because everybody else has done a book yep. if I had done it 17 years ago that would have been one thing but at this point I mean guys you got guys out there now doing fucking cookbooks yep. and shit like so I'm like Ugh. so that was my biggest thing about not wanting to do a book. Um, but I, you know, the stories are the stories. It's my life. It's my, again, like, I don't really think I'm telling anybody anything groundbreaking or new when it comes to some of the bands that I've been in. Mm -hmm. But what it does dive into is how I was feeling at the time all the insanity was happening. Yep. Me joining Motley, what was my headspace, my feeling, what was I thinking and feeling? And then the same when I left the band. Um, you know, so we'll see. Some people may go, eh, you know, it's 460 pages of awesome or it's 460 pages of shit. Who knows? We'll find out. I reckon we'll go with awesome because like, you've always said it like it is. You know, you've as long as I've known you, like as back as far back as wow, 1998, um, you've always said it like it is. And you, I remember the first time we met, 
was when you were here with ESP for the first tour. And we we're talking about the first union album. And you, the first thing you said to me is the one thing you'll learn about me is I'll say it like it is. And it usually gets me in trouble. Much. So, so the, the book will be you. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to diving into it. Is there one chapter or one kind of subject that was really hard to relive with the editing process? Um, you know, what's funny. I found that a lot of the things that were like the happier experiences actually put a little bit of a smile on my face, but man, there were some things when I was kind of going through like some of the bands that I was in when I was leaving the band, my reasons for leaving the band or divorces, just that nagging feeling it like just reading it again. I was like, Oh God, I gotta, I gotta walk away from this for a minute and go make a cup of coffee or tea or something. Um, so again, my intention is not to throw anybody under the bus. Um, it's really just me telling the truth. But from my perspective of what I was feeling at the time of these experiences happening. So, you know, I'm keeping my fingers crossed and hoping that I don't rub somebody the wrong way, but I don't really give a fuck. Yeah. It's, it's the past. It's over with. Um, you know, and again, that wasn't my intention. It was just, here's how I felt when this happened. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to piss a few people off, but again, I don't really give a shit. Perfect. Whatever. Wouldn't be the first time. And it won't be the last. Yes. Now, there is a, a double vinyl, like audio book with some musical accompaniment I saw Paul unveil about no, a it's week ago. Double, it, it's not a double vinyl. Okay. It's just a single vinyl record. And what they did is just as like a bundle package. Um, I did an audio book. I read the whole book. And then um, what they did is they took two stories. They put one on one side and one on the other. Okay. And um, it's just some, like some sort of pre-order bundle package, whatever. But the book is coming out at a hard hardcover. There will be a soft cover. Um, there's going to be an audio book. And the vinyl, like I said, is one story on one side, one story on the other. And it's like a maybe a collector's item, if you will. Yep, cool. Was it hard to actually go in, you know, you've written it all, it's all on paper, but then to go in and actually do an audio book sounds like incredibly draining in some ways. What was that like? It was, it was a little difficult because I literally had to go in and read the entire book from front to back. Um, so that took, that was about uh, 10 days of just sitting in a studio, recording studio um, for 10 or 12 hours a day reading into a microphone. So it was, uh, it was interesting. So, um, you know, we had some fun with it, <clears throat> goofing off. Like, you know, my sense of humor, it's yeah. a little off, but we had fun with it and it was great. It sounded great. So, um, and then they asked me initially, um, they wanted to use, I believe, um, Love Shine. And I was like, well, good luck with that because I can pretty much assure you that um, a certain member of that band will not allow me to use that song. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did is I wrote something kind of in the same tuning and um, changed up some of the notes and made it a little more uh almost um 
Arabic, flamingo, whatever. And it's just all this open tuning. So it's reminiscent of Love Shine, but it's not not really. Perfect. Now, yeah, you're like a couple of days from being on the plane down here. Um, for people that haven't seen you acoustically, like I haven't seen you acoustically. I've only seen you in all of your other bands. But basically, it's Karabi on a stool, talking shit, telling stories, singing songs. You know, when it comes time for you to, to put that set list together, I know you draw on some songs that you love from other bands and your own bands. Is there songs that you really want to put in, but they never work in that acoustic environment? Um, it, it just depends. Um, you know, like I, I just had somebody yell out, um, you know, I, I'll have somebody yell October morning wind or whatever. And if I can remember it, I'll do it. Um, kind of just brushing up on a few songs. Cause I mean, really in all honesty, I haven't played much in the last two years. So I'm just trying to brush up on everything, but, um, you know, I'd love to be able to play the rain song or, you know, whatever, but just going to have to figure it out, dude. There's, I, I don't even write a set list. I just kind of go for it. There's some stories um, it really depends on the feedback I'm getting from the audience. Um, but like I've tried doing Casi Bella acoustically. Yep. And it didn't work. Right. So I was like, and I just think maybe because it's new. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what the deal is. And, um, you know, we'll go, oh, we'll, I, we'll go from there. But I, I, I promise, sorry about the noise. Mm -hmm. um, I promise everybody will have a good time. Like I said, I, I used to do these acoustic shows and I was doing like, oh my God, I got to do like four songs from that record and four and four and four. And I, and I was doing like 20 to 25 songs. And, but then at the end of the night, I would sit at the bar or the merch table and I would wind up doing almost an interview about what the lyrics were for this song. Like, what made me think of that? Or what made me do this? Or why do you do that cover song? So I figured maybe do less songs and tell some stories. And they're true stories. Yeah. I just do them in a funny manner. But um, I'm sitting there. And I started telling the stories about the songs, why I do this one, how I wrote that, blah, 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 whatever. And it seems to be going much better. Like everybody, I've, I've actually had fans go, like lifelong fans go, man, I really love your music, but dude, you could have sat there and just told the stories and I would have been happier than a pig in shit. Yeah. So, um, you know, it'll be a good time, buddy. It'll be a pain in the ass, but if I could let it flow, it'd be pretty good acoustic. That one is very difficult to do because um, A, because I haven't done it in like 20 some years. <laughs> but I don't even think Union did it that often because it was a weird tuning. Yeah. Oh my God, let me go in the house. Um, it was a weird tuning. So um, it's it's very difficult. It's a very difficult song to do. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. Who knows? I, like if I can if I can figure it out. You never know. You never know. So if you had the crystal ball, what's the next twelve months of crab going to be like? Hopefully working. Um, Perfect. You know. Uh, look, we, we all just went through two years of bullshit and hell with, uh, you know, COVID. And um, I'm just glad that it's, you know, we're not back to normal yet. But I think all these countries are figuring out, like, fuck it, man. Like, we can't, we can't keep everybody, uh, we cannot keep everybody locked up for the rest of their lives so yeah. um you know i think they've just kind of figured out um 
all right, let's let's just go out and have fun. And you know what? If somebody gets COVID, we'll we'll just have to deal with it. You know, exactly. whatever. So I'm just happy to be back to work. I'm happy to be coming to Australia first time since 2019. And um I'm ready to go, dude. Awesome, man. I'm gonna see in Brisbane. You're actually playing a converted church in Brisbane. Okay, so, I hope it doesn't burn down when I yeah. enter. So many of us are hoping that. Um, hopefully, I hear there could be copies of the book available, so hopefully that's on the go. We're keeping our fingers crossed. I don't know how it's... Um, I don't know how it's um, panning out with customs and shipping. Yeah. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Let's all keep our fingers crossed. You'll be here like next week. So thanks for yes. your time, buddy. Um, I'll look forward to finally seeing you in Brisbane. Um, I'll bring the triangle. You bring the shade balls. Okay. Awesome, buddy. I'm looking forward to it. See you, man. Have a good day. All right, buddy. Cheers. Bye. See you. There he is, Andrew. Hey, mate. How you doing? I'm really well. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. How, how's it on your end? Yeah, excellent. Sounds good. Perfect. Thanks for taking the time out tonight to drop by. Yeah, no worries. So no, managed to fit it in all right. It worked well, yeah. So I chatted with Crab this morning. Um, he gave me his sort of insights into the process of the book. Um, I want you to tell everyone about it from your side of things, like when it first came onto your radar and, like, did he reach out to you or did you reach out to him regarding it? Yeah, I reached out to him. Um, I, I guess it was a long time coming, really. So, you know, for two decades, I um, daily kind of scoured the internet and other news sources to find out all the latest happenings with any of the Motley Crue band members. And I, I started that in 1995 when Karabi was still in the band. Um, so as he got replaced, when Vince came back in, my site actually went live on the day that Vince, uh, reappeared with the band at the American Music Awards on the 27th of January in 97. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I did was as I was documenting the history from that point on for the next 20 odd years, I was still writing, uh, about Karabi in that history as well. I considered him a former member as such. And I, I thought that fans would still be interested to see what he's up to and hear about kind of his latest things and stuff like that. Um, but what I didn't really know a lot of was his time before he came to, to be in Motley Crue. Now, obviously I was a fan of the scream and, you know, I had the scream album and uh, I still love that, that album, let it scream so much. But prior to that, um, I didn't really know a lot, particularly about his childhood and his upbringing and, and all of that. And of course we knew those stories with all the other guys in Motley yeah. But didn't have a clue about Karabi. So it was, um, you know, fast forward to 2019, he toured Australia uh, with his band and, and played the, uh, you know, that 94 album from top to bottom. Yeah. And um, I, I couldn't resist the opportunity to kind of jump on that tour and, um, and do all those shows around the country with him. And it was after the first night in Sydney, um, we went and had dinner. And then um, the promoter drove us back to the hotel and, um, and Crab had his, uh, his vape. So he was outside having a vape before, you know, going back inside. And it was then I said to him, hey, we should, um, we should think about doing a book. And he was like, ah, yeah, I don't really know about that, you know. And, uh, and I guess, you know, he's, he's thought that maybe the timing wasn't right or it seemed like everybody was kind of bringing a book out, stuff like that. And, and I said to him, look, you know, there's a lot of fans that you've got that really don't know a lot about you. You know, they, they know your music, which is obviously great and, and really the most important thing. But I think there's a lot of people that would like to learn a bit more about you and kind of behind the scenes and know more of your story and, um, and how everything came to be. So that was really kind of, you know, how it started. I, I'd had those thoughts for a long time and then I had the opportunity to kind of broach the subject with him and kind of get his arm and just twist it up behind his back a little bit. Yeah. Well, not many people know that he actually first started a book over 15 years ago, um, you know, and he had some transcript ideas and 
And then he, as he said to me today, he sort of put it to bed because, as you said, everyone was putting books out and he just didn't feel like jumping on the bandwagon. So um, I'm really glad yeah. that you you twisted it gently because we all know, especially <laughs> the uh, the Aussies next week, we'll get to know what a storyteller he is. So like 460 pages of uh, Karabi is going to be great. Was... You, you mentioned yeah. his childhood. You mentioned all of that. Was there a particular moment when you were doing interviews with him for the book when something just totally blew you out of the water that you were like, I couldn't imagine someone living that in their life and without giving too much away? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, there's one particular story. Um, well, I guess what I knew was coming was the story about Uncle Jack, right? Because of the song. We know that that's a bit of an autobiographical song about his uh, abusive uncle and, and what happened there with the family. So we kind of knew a little bit about that, but he goes into detail around explaining that full story. So it really kind of makes sense and, and readers will get to kind of experience that and how nauseating and and yeah like that's that's quite a story and i just couldn't imagine that happening to anybody uh in their lives and you know wouldn't wish that kind of situation on my own worst enemy um but um he certainly recounts that story but that's one i kind of knew was coming but there's another one in there that's an encounter with uh with a serial killer and those that have read the little kind of synopsis piece that's being advertised for the book Mm -hmm. uh, on, on Amazon and on the publisher, uh, redbirdlit.com on their website. There's just this little bit that says, you know, about an encounter with a serial killer. And that's a story that he's never spoken about before. Uh, people don't know about that. And to me, that's, it's quite amazing. Um, and it's actually one of the, uh, one of the stories that was selected as kind of the best of to put on the audio book vinyl. Mm -hmm. version on the gatefold vinyl that story kind of takes up side a of the audiobook vinyl but i think that's one that's really gonna um you know spin a lot of people out um you know it's quite amazing fans of true crime uh will certainly be interested in that story as well you mentioned the gatefold vinyl um you let me know today that the original plan was to have love shine a company but of course he didn't think it right to even try to broach publishing and permission and things. So he wrote a piece of music, Love Shine esque, without without encroaching. Yeah. So, um, how was it when you first heard that come through before it got pieced together with the actual story? Yeah, I remember the day that he uh, he sent me that piece of music. I mean, we throughout the whole process. Um, I'd been encouraging him once we once we landed on the title of the book called Horseshoes and Hand Grenades. Um, then I was encouraging him, knowing that he's in writing mode again. Um, I've been encouraging him to write a song called Horseshoes and Hand Grenades and have it kind of you know summarising the book um, and and that kind of how the title came to be and stuff like that. Um, but for one reason or another, you know that hasn't happened. Excuse my cat. That's all right. Oh, this is wild. Um, so, um, yeah, so that, that didn't happen. But um, doing the audio book, um, you know, he, he went to the studio of our uh, publishing company. They've got their own studio in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, he spent many days narrating the whole story. So the audio book is all in his voice. So his, you know, his dulcet tones will be familiar for fans and stuff like that. Um, but as part of that process, the, uh, the publisher was saying, look, you know, what would be good to do with the audio book is to put, um, put some, um, you know, original music or, you know, maybe some cover versions or something like that. Yeah. Um, just as a little background music in behind the audio book, just to kind of give it a bit more vibe and, um, and you know, something else for fans to enjoy. Um, so once they kind of said that, then yeah, he kind of, you know, thought about what songs might fit and work and, and stuff like that. So when he sent me through that new original piece of, of music, I was like, oh, wow, this is cool. You know, it, it like totally fits and works and yeah. stuff like that. So, yeah. 
And yeah, when, when we spoke today, he, he mentioned, you know, like besides the two are coming down here about, you know, he's had people say to him, like, I could probably just sit there and not worry about you playing the songs and you could just tell me the stories. And, I, and, you know, his exact words were, I'd be happy as a pig in shit. So as the guy <laughs> translating Karabi to book form, well, well, it all is his words, you know, sometimes the, the job of a co-writer is to not, not manipulate, but, but bring out, you know, bring the cream to the crop, like to the top, you know, was there any time that you just sat down and went, I can't believe this guy is telling me this. Yeah, you mentioned before about, you know, his previous attempt uh, with the book. You know, he was writing some stuff and he had another author um, that was writing some stuff. And, um, you know, when we started putting the project together, one of the things that uh, I wanted to explore with him was why that didn't go ahead. Um, because, you know, if there were some issues with that, then obviously I didn't want to fall into those same pitfalls. And for this project not to go ahead, I was pretty determined that this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about that and, and he said to me that he felt that um, when he read what was previously written, you know, the start of, uh, of a manuscript, he felt that it wasn't him. It didn't sound like him. He, it kind of, he felt like he didn't own it. It wasn't his voice and that. So um, that was music to my ears because in my head, I had that it would actually be him standing in front of a crowd of people actually mm -hmm. telling these stories as the narrator, yeah. uh, which is how, you know, the, the end point that we've got to now with it. So uh, uh, when we talked about, you know, the best way of putting the book together, um, we, we felt that it would be best to do it as a series of interviews where I would ask him and prompt him and prob and probe, you know, to... to to get him to tell these yep. stories, to flush all these stories of his life out. And then what I did was basically I recorded all of that, um, of him telling these stories in his own words, and then I transcribed it all and then basically um, made it all flow as a, as a, as a book mm -hmm. um, because we didn't do it all in chronological order. The, the book is pretty much in chronological order which is kind of what I'm known for with Motley's history anyway, yep. but I didn't want it to be an exact timeline. Um, so it's, it loosely follows, you know, uh, the timeline. Part one of the book, uh, the beginning, is all uh, situated in Philadelphia where he was born and, and grew up. Um, the middle of the book, part two, is all in Los Angeles. And then the, uh, the third and final part of the book is all in Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, as it's followed his journey kind of crisscrossing across the US. Um, so, yeah, so I really wanted it to be, um, as a reader and as a fan, when you're reading it, you can kind of really picture him saying this exact story to you yeah. in the book format. I wanted it to be authentic in that regard, and, um, and I, I believe it absolutely is. Like, people will go, oh, yeah, that's Karabi, you know, for, for sure, telling these stories of his life. Yeah, and the thing I said to him today is like, you know, I've known him since 1998 now. Um, and the one thing is that he is Karabi. He never changes. People are going to love him and he's always going to rub someone up the wrong way. And, you know, and as he <laughs> said, like when, when he puts his book out, that's not his intention, but he's, he's sure at some point someone will take offense with something. Is, it, is that the way you feel about it too? Like, you know, like you said, he doesn't give a shit, but do you feel that there's going to be someone out there that's just going to go, uh, you know, I'm not happy? Look, I, I believe, uh, you know, in the same thing that you can't please all of the people all of the time. So yep. um, one thing that I made sure with him uh, when we started, um, I said to him, look, I want this to be an honest account, right? No bullshit. And, and I know he's that kind of guy anyway, but yep. I'm like, this has got to be truthful. This has got to be, you know, how it was. And obviously it's his version of the truth, right? But I want him to be able to put hand on heart and say, this is absolutely, you know, my my version of the truth and the way that I recall everything that, that happened and went down and stuff like that. So, you know, he, he said in interviews that, you know, it's not, you know, him dishing the dirt on, on bandmates um, or, you know, 
ex-wives or girlfriends and things like that. It's, it's really, you know, his experiences going through his journey of life and yeah. the things that have happened along the way. So, you know, some people might recall some of the stories differently um, that, that were there. Some people might get their nose put out of joint. But, you know, I wanted to make sure and be clear with Karabi that, you know, it's his stories truthfully and honestly um and as i said he's that kind of guy you know anyway yeah i mean to me he's he's kind of the most humble kind of you know rock star quote unquote um that one could ever meet you know i've, I've been fortunate enough to spend a bit of time you know with quite a few rock stars um and um you know he's just so down to earth and and real and genuine and humble um he's just uh he's just a good bloke as we say in australia yeah and the one thing, and, and this, this is the thing I'm looking forward to when you say it's his recollections. And we know that, like, he, he doesn't need to uh, glorify anything. He's very warts and all. But Karabi's got an incredibly good memory for someone that's lived a pretty hardcore life at times. And, you know, like, he, he reminded me today of exactly where it was the last time we met. And that was seven years ago. You know, yeah. so I'm... I'm sure that when this book comes out, people are going to be taken aback by how in depth he's probably going to go. Yeah. So I had, um, I had a lot of things documented through some of the years where things were a bit fuzzy because it was so fast paced for him and stuff like that, where it was a bit hard to remember. Um, so I was able to help prompt him on, on dates and timings to help get order right and stuff like that with a lot of parts, but you're right. He does have a, a great memory uh, for this stuff. It's almost like, I think his memory is a photographic memory. He, he gets kind of an image and then he'll kind of describe that scene and, and exactly. setting. Makes him a great storyteller because he's, he, he's recounting that picture that he's recalling and can see in his head again. Um, I think another contributing factor to that is, um, you know, he's, ne he's never done hard drugs and that over the year as well, which can uh, do all sorts of strange things to people's uh, mental capacity and wiring and, and stuff like that. So I think, yeah, you know, he's, he's pretty together um, and definitely got a great memory, that's for sure. Yeah, now, I know when you did your unveiling of the vinyl um, on your Facebook a little while ago, you're also talking about the hopes that there could be books arriving in time for the shows next week. John said he wasn't sure. Have you got any update? Uh, publisher emailed me this morning and said they're expecting the tracking details from the printer and their, their binder like any moment. So then it depends how long, you know, FedEx takes to, uh, to get them down to Australia from the US. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got to hope that there's no issues with uh, customs and any delays there with all the books um, coming down. So um, we're cutting it really fine. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this tour, you know, is a little bit before the release date of the book. The, the book's, you know, uh, 14th of, of June worldwide. So this tour is a little bit before. So, you know, we've kind of put a bit of pressure on the publisher to try and get some earlier copies done and stuff like that. And, you know, with the pandemic, I mean, you know, the shipping and... Um, uh, production lines and supply chains and that globally there's a lot of issues with supply chain you know fans might know just trying to get vinyl records you know stuff like that uh from uh, from you know bands and and labels offering them and that i mean it's it's kind of crazy some of the things that are going on yeah. out there at the moment so so we're hopeful that we'll have some books um arrive in time for the shows um but look time will tell it's kind of in the lap of the gods at this stage there's not much more that yeah uh Krabi and i can do yeah and, and another project to here's the one that i was involved in the the union reissues met the same sort of production line fate so i completely understand um how yep. much how much union is delved into in the book um the work that i've done um in documenting motley Crue's history um, I've always approached that to be the most thorough and comprehensive account of those stories and all the happenings that, that happened. And that's really the approach that I took with Karabi's autobiography as well. I wanted to cover it from his first breath 
all the way through to, you know, how he sees himself dying mm-hmm. um, and everything in between and, and to really have all the detail because, I mean, you know, behind me here there's a whole bunch of, you know, rock biographies and stuff like that yeah. and, and sometimes when I'm reading them, the artist will be recounting a story but then I'll be left with questions like, oh, but I wonder, you know, what about this or what about that? I, I feel like it kind of doesn't tell the whole story and it's left me wondering and I feel like I don't actually fully know or comprehend, you know, what went down there or what happened or or what. So, you know, with the way I feel when I read uh, rock biographies, I wanted, to, I wanted it to be comprehensive so that fans really understood the true picture of everything that happened and they, they know the story from, from end to end. So that's the way that we approached all of the, uh, all of the stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so if he recounted a situation and described it and told the story about it, if I had any things that I was like, oh, but what about this or that? I would ask him and get that and then work that in and, and weave that in. So, so it's actually, it's got everything in there. But the problem with that, and if you've ever, you know, heard Karabi tell stories, um, he's got quite a long-winded way of, of telling a story yeah. because he's, he's telling it all yep. as well, right? Um, so we're both a little bit like that in, in the way that we, we go about things. So what we needed to do was to trim it down. Um, so we went through, you know, a lot of editing cycles to... It was really to cull um, the content down and distill it down to, you know, all the, the best stuff but still have that comprehensiveness to it all before we submitted it to um, a publisher. Um, we were then concerned that the publisher would want to really, you know, kind of go the hack on it and really trim yeah. it down a lot more because the word count is still really high for a, a rock and roll um, autobiography. Um, but when the publisher, um, when, when they read it, they said, you know what, it's actually quite a really long book, but it doesn't feel long when you're reading it. It's, it's kind of light and it flows and... You know, it's a page turner, you know. Um, it's not, yep. you know, laborious um, when you're reading it. It's not heavy going. As much as there's some heavy moments in the book, it flows and it keeps going and, you know, there's a lot of humour in the book, as you'd expect, as well as the dark moments. So it's got light and dark in there. It's got some amazing things. It's got, you know, all the troughs and valleys of the roller coaster of what it's like to be a rock and roll artist over decades. So, um yeah, so it's comprehensive. It's got everything in there, um, but it's definitely a long read. Um, so I think people will really be getting their money's worth and feeling like they really do truly know Karabi's story. He said to me today, he goes, I hope everyone takes something out of it. He goes, if it's anything like the rest of my career, in 15 years it'll become a cult classic that's you know sought after instead of right now. So I, I made the, the point that, you know, in 15 years, if you want to do an expanded edition, the John Karabi colouring book to be included in the back end <laughs> is the way to go. Um, so now, but now you've completed this and it's, for want of a better word, it's put to bed. It's with the publisher, it's being printed. What's next for you as an author? Yeah, so there's been a couple of people that I'm talking to about doing a, a similar thing autobiography-wise. Um, so whether those projects end up panning out uh, or not, um, time will will tell. Um, there might also be some other people that, you know, kind of want to reach out once they've read this book um, and, uh, and explore a, a project. The one that I've got in mind currently is, uh, is more of a photographic uh, book as well so I've recently moved from the forest uh, back into the city here in Melbourne and um, and people in Melbourne wear black clothing it's kind of renowned for it so it's a it's a photographic book kind of based on uh, on that as a theme um, is something that I might uh, might do I'm kind of finding myself you know I'm averaging about six kilometers a day walking around the city going here and there and stuff like that and in my travels I'm, I'm kind of seeing different things and it's sparking creative ideas and stuff like that and which is one of the reasons why I moved back into the city you know the forest was great to be um you know remote um you know when the pandemic was happening and you didn't really want to be around other people yeah 
and stuff. But uh, now that we've kind of uh, progressed through it and it feels like we're coming out the other side, I was saying to someone the other day that it, it kind of feels like a bushfire or a wildfire has kind of gone through and it's blackened everything. But now we're getting all the green shoots kind of coming back and it's all starting to thrive again and everything's coming back to life. And I kind of was at a point where I wanted to kind of get amongst the action more and, uh, and move back into the city. And now that I am, I've been in the city here for about six, seven weeks now, I'm getting all these creative ideas of new projects and, uh, and things like that. So um, I'm just kind of rolling with it and uh, we'll see, you know, there's still a lot of work to do um, on the promotion side uh, with the book um, rather than writing. But um, yeah, I've, I've always got a few projects kind of, you know, bubbling away on the back burner uh, at any time I find. That's great. So you mentioned to me you might be out at some of these shows. So um, what's the plan yeah, for that? Yeah, I'm going to jump. In. Yeah, I'm going to do the whole run. Um, so, um, yeah, so up to Sydney um, next Thursday night. It's the first show. So I head up there for that. And then um, Crab's got uh, quite a few days uh, break to kind of get over the jet lag. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a long flight coming from the US down yeah. to Australia. I know that last time, um, you know, he, he felt the jet lag, um, you know, a fair bit. So he, he's asked the promoter to have, have a few days there. So we'll just hang out for a few days and let him adjust and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and then we'll be up to Brisbane. Um, so uh, looking forward to, uh, to catching up with you when I get up to Brisbane. Uh, then it's back down to Melbourne and then off to Adelaide. And then we finish in Perth. Uh, which is my old hometown. So mm -hmm. I'm going to take that opportunity and spend a little bit longer and catch up with family that I haven't seen for a few years since the pandemic and that. Um, and he's going to fly straight back out to the US from there. So, um, yeah, so looking forward to it. It'd be good to kind of, um, you know, get into a different headspace, get on the road and, uh, and have a, a lot of laughs uh, along the way, no doubt, hanging out with Krabi. We always seem to be ragging each other about something you know he'll be calling me a convict or something and no doubt yeah well you don't really have a lot to go on with him now he's dropped the captain jack sparrow look yeah well, when you were saying you know Krabi, he's the same all the time i was thinking in my mind yeah except for his uh you know his hairstyle uh that's one thing that uh he's certainly changed a lot over the years and he's rocking a bit of a uh, a different look these days that's for sure yeah, yeah, the Brides of Dreadlock look as long gone. Yeah, right, mate. yeah, those so, were the rap days. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave you for the night. Thanks for your time. Is there anything you want to leave us with about the book, about what you've got coming up, and about uh, Skin Ink? Yeah, thanks, Andrew, for, uh, for, for having me on. Look, I'm just really super proud of this book. Um, you know, this is the 10th book that, uh, that I'll be putting out. And uh, I do believe that this is my best work. And I know that, you know, everybody says that this, you know, my latest album and it's my best record yeah. yet. But, um, you know, I, it's not just a kind of a promo thing. I actually, you know, hand on heart, do firmly believe that, that this is my best work um, that I've written to date. Um, you know, it's kind of weird. You know, when I when I heard the audio book vinyl and, and put that on for the first time, it was just such a trip kind of hearing all of those words that I wrote with him of his stories and that and hearing them, you know, come back and stuff like that. So I'm sure when the books do finally arrive here, I'm actually looking forward to uh, getting the, the physical copy in my hands rather yep. than just, you know, P PDF on the screen yeah. kind of thing and, uh, and sitting down and, you know, and having another read of it. It's probably been about probably four or five months since I've read the book kind of, you know, cover to cover wow. as such as well. So looking forward to, to having another read. I'm sure, you know, more stories will, will come to mind. Yep. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I just i am really excited for fans um, of his from all eras, you know, that like all the different bands or just one of those bands in particular to learn more about him and to read these stories because it's, it's a phenomenal tale. I mean, you know, The Dirt has obviously gone on to be, um, you know, a, a, a best-selling smash, right? Um, sold over a million copies and stuff like that. And I was fortunate to be, you know, asked to contribute um, to that as it was getting put together and stuff like that. Um, and Krabi's got a few stories in that book, but 
you know, and we all know the stories of the other guys in Motley and, you know, yep. how they had rough childhoods and stuff like that. And, you know, I just kind of feel that, you know, Karabi's story is every bit as good and as crazy and wild and, you know, um, and amazing as, uh, as what fans have come to expect from, uh, from anybody that's ever been in Motley Crue. Um, you know, he doesn't have the, the drug stories because, as I said, he's never been into the hard drugs and he's never been to jail kind of, um, you know, but he's got these other amazing stories, which I think are going to blow people away. Um, so I just can't wait for people to read it and, uh, and enjoy those stories. That's for sure. Awesome. mate! I can't wait to read it myself. I'm stoked. I cannot wait to get my hands on it. So I will see you in Brisbane. I look forward to seeing you. It's been 17 years probably since I've seen you in the flesh. So that'll be great. Wow. Yeah. Long time. Long, Long time. time. So thanks so much. For, yeah. Lots of photo shoots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having no worries, me on, mate. Andrew. See you when you're Appreciate up here. It. Thank you. Bye. Right on. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Zen Session as presented by Here to Zen Magazine. If you are listening to us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. If you are listening on one of the podcast platforms, please subscribe there. And don't forget to follow Here to Zen Magazine on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.